The world's art is the ammo. Your screen is the weapon. And you are in our sights. Our final guest has been in more than 350 televised, has had more than 350 televised appearances, including such shows as Batman, Star Trek, The Man from Uncle, Alias Smith Jones, Gunsmoke, The Bob Hope Show, Get Smart, Mission Impossible, The Lucy Show, Jason of Star Command, Shaft, The Six Million Dollar Man, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, The Dukes of Hazard, The A-Team, and MacGyver, just to name a few. In a combined 55 years of acting in film, some of the 144 and counting he starred in include Spider Baby, The Big Doll House, Diamonds Are Forever, THX 1138, and Galaxies of Terror. However, most of us probably recognize him through a few films made by Hollywood superfans Rob Zombie and Quentin Tarantino. These works include House of a Thousand Corpses, The Devil's Rejects, The Lords of Salem, Halloween, Jackie Brown, and Kill Bill Volume 2. And as um, soon as he makes his way up to the stage, I think I know, you all know who that's going to be. Um, let me be back up here in just a second. Please welcome to the stage, Sid Haig. Yeah, this is fucking awesome. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling just fine. Wait a second. Yes. Cool. <laughs> Can you hear this? All right. We're all good. All right. All right. So, like, uh, we'll start soft. Like, uh, life before show business. <laughs> like, life uh, before show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I think I was always in show business. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I was growing so fast that everything wasn't coming together right. And so I was really clumsy. I could trip over a dime. And uh, so my parents decided that they were going to give me dance lessons. OK, so I, yeah, sure. So I went to the dance class. And I just had so much fun. I thought it was great. And uh, so I started dancing. And by the time I was seven, I was getting paid to dance. OK? Wow. <laughs> and I went from dancing to music and got paid to play. Uh, one year out of high school, signed a record contract with Keen Records and uh, wound up number four on the charts and went from that to acting. And you just gave them the history there. So <laughs> basically what we're talking about is <laughs> I don't like to work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did getting involved or did acting in major productions for television film come hand in hand right away? Or like, uh, how did that come to be? Well, it started very slowly. I did the, first, the first film I did was a film called The Host. And it was a short. And it was uh, Jack Hill's student film at UCLA. Jack Hill is known basically for all of the exploitation stuff that he's done. He, did, he was one of the originators of the black exploitation, women in prison f films, all kinds of stuff. So um, he's my guy. And uh, speaking of Jack Hill, I believe you've had the most repeat collaborations with him of everybody you've worked with. Pretty much, yeah. I've done like 10 films for him. Yeah, and I was, um, I was wondering like how y'all's working relationship evolved since the first project. To the last. Well, we were just so relaxed around one another because I trusted him, he trusted me, and um, I would go off script. You know, I'd say, you know, this is cool, but what about if I did this? And he said, well, do it. And you know, that's what scissors are for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I just do whatever came into my crazy head, and he would most of the time keep it and and wind up in the film. Yeah. And I guess by far one of my favorite films that y'all have collaborated on was Spider Baby. And I was wondering if y'all could, you could share any stories from the set of that. Or that was, yeah, that was an amazing thing. That was Lon Chaney Jr.'s last starring role. Yes. Um, and uh, he was so, he had a history of alcoholism, okay? But he was so... Uh, flattered that people remembered him and wanted him to do this film that he had it put in the contract that
that he could not have a drink while shooting this film. Wow. Yeah, and he and I spent a lot of time together. Uh, he basically became my mentor, gave me all kinds of really great advice, told me what to do, what not to do, um, and just in terms of conducting myself in a business, um, the steps, you know. Wow, that's really, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And then I guess um, going forward, I guess, with um, Jackie Brown, or I guess um, Jack Hill's sort of impression on other filmmakers that you've worked with, when Quentin Tarantino reached out to you about the role he re wrote for you and Jackie Brown, did he bring up the importance of coffee or Foxy Brown to you, or? Um, actually, I was supposed to do Pulp Fiction, okay? Yeah. Uh, but I had done so much television, and television, you just grind the work out, you know? Gee, I gotta get so many setups a day, they don't care what it looks like or anything, just get it done. That's why a lot of television is kind of trashy. Mm -hmm. In the last <laughs> six weeks, and it's gone. Um, uh, and I had had a talk with my agents about not wanting to do that anymore, you know, just cranking stuff out just to get it out. And um, I went and I auditioned for um, Pulp Fiction, and he wanted me to do it, and uh, I wanted to do it, and the deal came down, and it was for one day. If you remember the part of Marcellus, Mm -hmm. Okay, Wallace. Uh, he was in four different locations throughout the film. And I said, how the hell are you going to go to four locations in one day? Okay, it's impossible. It's more television. No, I don't want to do it. Nobody told me that that's not the way he works. You know, if the one day takes one day, but if the one day takes two weeks, it's okay. Nobody bothered to tell me that, so I turned it down. Stupid. Uh, <laughs> not me, the people that didn't tell me that. <laughs> right, right. Okay? Um, so that was, you know, that was that deal. But we, you know, we did the Jackie Brown, and the deal was that he didn't tell Pam Greer that I was playing the judge um, just to kind of surprise her because Pam and I had done six films together. Yeah. Okay? And when she came on the set and saw me in the judge's robes, she just cracked up laughing, and she wound up on the floor. She, she couldn't hold herself together. It was very cool. That's awesome. And I guess of all the six movies that y'all have done, I guess y'all's sort of like a working and personal relationship has grown over time. With yeah, you. yeah. We had a, we had a great relationship. Uh, we had one another's back all the time because, you know, doing films in the Philippines, you're, you're in the jungle, okay? So you're basically prey. Uh, so we're, you know, watching out for snakes and spiders and making sure that she didn't trip over this or that or the other thing. And she had my back, too. It was all very cool. She was doing a, um, uh, a convention in Denver, and she was doing a Q&A just like I'm doing now. And some guy says, uh, you and Sid Haig have done a lot of films together, and he started to say something else, and she stopped him, and she said, no, we did not fuck. Okay? <laughs> so yeah. that's that. That put that to bed. <laughs> right on. And then I guess um, like Rob Zombie and Quentin Tarantino are obviously fans of your work, both past and present, whenever they got you on those roles. And I guess whenever the cameras weren't rolling, was there intense Q&As on the sets of their own? There or? was no Q&As Q with, uh, with Quentin because Quentin is an absolute film buff. Any downtime, he was reciting lines from films that I did like 30 years ago, okay? And I'm going, how the hell do you remember all this shit? I can't even remember it, you know? Um, but he's, you know, he's very intense. Mm -hmm. Working with Quentin is like working inside a blender, okay? He's got all of this energy, and it just goes out 360 degrees and sucks you into it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And then I guess um, one of the, re I guess hearing some of the interviews he did in the past, like uh, sounds like Rob Zombie was a huge Jason of Star Command fan. Yeah, well, I, and I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I was at uh, Rob and Sherry's wedding, uh, reception and talking to his brother 
And he said, this is so weird. And I said, what, the wedding? He says, no, standing here talking to you. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, when Rob and I were kids, we used to wake up every Saturday morning and watch Jason of Star Command, and you scared the shit out of us, okay? And then I started popping up in films that Rob liked, and at one point he said, if I ever get to direct a movie, I want that guy in it. That's how I got House of a Thousand Corpses. Easy peasy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's an example of watch out what you do today because it's going to jump up and bite you in the ass later. It's either going to be good or bad. Karma's a bitch. And uh, I know these sorts of questions aren't exactly the most fair, but you've been in a ton of TV shows, and I was wondering which would you say was you feel was the most important to your career? Well, okay, th on a couple of different levels. Uh, as far as drama was concerned, I would have to say Mission Impossible because I did nine of those. Um, no other actor in Hollywood had, had ever done that many episodes on that show so and it was it was it was a good show uh anybody remember mission impossible yeah yeah okay. yeah all there right. we are okay yeah. so yeah all right so you and i are going to talk about this um, <laughs> <laughs> um so from the dramatic standpoint there was that but from the comedic standpoint uh i had such a ball on mary hartman mary hartman yeah. Uh, that was just total insanity because you'd, you'd come at 8 o'clock in the morning and they'd give you the, the script that you're going to do that day, okay? And then you would block out all the scenes and then you block the scenes with the cameras and then they sent you off to learn your lines, okay? At 5 o'clock, you came back and uh, just did the show. There was never any cuts. There was never any take twos. None of that stuff. If you got in trouble, you just worked it out, okay? And they were they were just doing stuff on the run. I mean, I remember one time I was doing a scene with somebody, and I saw something over here in my periphery, okay? And I just took the opportunity to kind of just look over this way, and I looked back, and, and it said, Sid, say this, okay? They were giving me the lines on, on cue cards while I'm already in a scene, all right? And then the director would never say stop tape. He just would want to see what we would do, okay? So uh, particularly with Dabney Coleman and me, when we were in a scene together, they just, they'd just keep the tape running and whatever we came up with, we came up with. Mm -hmm. And we were doing this thing with this guy that's supposed to be the head of the GGG, the Glorious Guardians of Good. Get the reference there? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he was supposed to be my boss. And he says, when we take over the White House, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to get me a copy of Hustler magazine and sit in the hot tub all damn day. Okay? Yeah. And that was supposed to be the end of the scene. Well, not, no. He said, is that all you have in your mind? And it's supposed to end with me, like a quizzical look on my face, like, is there anything else? Okay. <laughs> But they never said, stop tape. So I said, well, I would like to have a baby gorilla, okay? <laughs> Still no stop tape. Uh, with a little gold chain, nothing. I said, I'd call him Max and teach him how to make Mai Tais, okay? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> stop, stop, stop tape, stop tape, okay? <laughs> and that wound up. In the, on the show, so yeah. that's the way that whole show worked. Day in and day out, we put six shows in the can every five days. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> wow. I guess as I start to slow things down, if anybody has any questions, um, okay, you got any good answers? <laughs> All right. Okay. So I'll just come back for just a second. Um, I guess. Whenever, before I started doing research, like a madman for the last two or three days, like I noticed on like the Batman box set that you were in like two episodes of that. And I just wanted to know what being on that set was like given the circumstances of. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun to do. Um, it was a situation where people were dying to get on that show. And just 
by coincidence, extreme coincidence, I was, I had a guest starring role in a different TV show every night of the week for an entire week. And I said, you know what, I got to take out an ad for this because this doesn't happen every day. So I took out an ad in Variety and, and The Hollywood Reporter and the producer of uh, Batman called in his casting director and he said, how come this guy's doing every show but mine? Get his ass in here tomorrow, okay? <laughs> so they called and they said, go see, you know, uh, the guys at Batman. I said, all right. So I walked in and he handed me a script. He said, go in that room, read the script, and whatever part you want's yours. I said, okay, cool. Wow. <laughs> I can do this. That's really cool. Um, anybody got anything? There you go. Yeah. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. You touched base a little bit working with Robin Cherry, like huh? how you got the role. But what was it? What was it like actually to work with Robin Cherry? Um, Rob is very laid back, very cool, no big drama or anything like that. He he makes his vision. This is the way a director should work. He makes his vision clear to you, and then he gets the hell out of the way and lets you do your job. Okay. Sherry is like my daughter. That's, I mean, that's the relationship that we have. Yeah. That's awesome. Anybody else got one? Or... Damn, for real? Well, shit. All right. All right. Oh, Yo. I'm back there. All right. Come on up. How are you doing this morning, Mr. Haig? I'm doing fine. Fantastic. Um, my favorite scene that you've done in all your work is that one scene in The Devil's Rejects where you carjack that lady and her child. <laughs> that scene for me was just so captivating and just it sucked me in. Would you mind telling us how that came about, how, that, uh, uh, how you came about doing that, how that really uh, just... It was I don't know just how to put crazy. It. <laughs> I went nuts and <laughs> just started running my mouth, okay? Uh, we got some top secret clown business that supersedes any need that you might have for this here vehicle. Okay. And she says, what's that about clowns? I said, Do I stutter, bitch? Okay. Yeah. Then and then with the kid, you know, what's the matter, kid? Don't you like clowns? Don't we make you laugh? Don't we, aren't we fucking funny? <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to come back here and check up on you and your mama. You ain't got a good reason for hating clowns? I'm going to kill your whole fucking family. Now get the fuck out of this car. Damn. You mean that scene? Yeah, okay. Well, I guess if no one's got... Duke's story. That's Dukes of Hazard's story. Dukes of Hazard story. Jesus, I, I, you know, the only thing that I remember about that particular episode is towards the end we started selling those uh, phony stocks, okay? And the, and the, we even got the dog involved in, in the deal, licking the envelopes. And the way we got the dog to lick the envelopes is we put a little line of peanut butter where the, where the glue goes, okay? Yeah. That's, that's my Dukes of Hazard story. And then I guess, what, in a... I guess in a few of the shows and the movies that you've done, studio tours would have to have happened at the same time. And I was wondering, like, if there was any, like, interactions with... Studio wars, you mean? Or studio tours of, like, people taking pictures and coming by the sets and stuff while you're working. Oh, um... <laughs> Sometimes people just don't engage their brain and, and, and think about what they're saying. That we were doing a film called The Swashbuckler with uh, Robert Shaw and James Earl Jones. Thank you. <laughs> the one person that saw that movie. <laughs> the only person in the theater. <laughs> um, and uh, Avery Schreiber, remember the guy that used to do the uh, Dorito potato chip thing where he's snapping off and off? Well, he was on the film too, and he and I were standing there talking, and the tour bus pulls up. And um, the people get out and they're, you know, this woman, and this woman comes up and she goes to him, she goes, sign this. 
And he goes, yes, ma'am, no problem. He goes, um, and what's your name? Mary. Okay, dear Mary, fuck you. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Impolite bitch. <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, yeah. And anything else before I segue? Oh, there we are. things that oh i know uh, tarantino and rob zombie are pretty different but there are any things that they how do you say um act the same on when it comes to you know filming movies that they might talk to you about that you were like oh that's different that they're pretty similar on that when it comes to thinking yeah well <clears throat> the thing that's similar is what i brought up before they both <clears throat> rob and quentin tarantino and jack hill just make their vision clear and then they get the hell out of the way and let you do your job which is the way it should work. If they had enough trust in you to hire you, then they should have enough trust to know that you know what you're doing. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I think we got time for one more. Right. All right. Gentleman on the phone. <laughs> Mr. Haig, you've uh, worked with some of the most iconic people in Hollywood, uh, Pam Greer, and just had a long history in Hollywood. Who of the people you've worked with is someone that you are awestruck by and that you respect greatly? Lon Chaney Jr. Yeah. Pam. <laughs> I, <clears throat> we were on the set and we were, I mean, Spider Baby was a, a guerrilla filmmaking at its finest. We did that whole film in, in 11 days, okay? Um, and, it, and so there was very little uh, crew members and stuff like that. And at one point, they were ready for Lon's scene that he was going to do. And there was nobody to go get him. So Jack turned to me and said, you know, go get uh, Lon Chaney so we can get this done. So I went and I knocked on his dressing room door and I said uh, Mr. Cheney they're ready for you and he said stop enough of the Mr. Cheney bullshit you're Sid I'm Lon we're working together knock that other stuff off and that's when we really started to bond as as uh, actors yeah um, and then um, I guess you do the whole Instagram thing now too I do do the whole Instagram thing. Yes, yes. I got all kinds of shit going on there. Uh, come and visit me at um, Sid Haig Says. Okay? We'll have a good time. Right on. Yeah. And then I guess we have a surprise for the stage. <laughs> yes, we do. So I'm wondering if we could have Mr. Bear Lee, sword swallowing extraordinaire, up on stage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for those who do not know who I am, my name is Bear Lee, and I'm a multiple world record holding sword swallower. And from right here in Texas. Woo! Yeah. Was anybody here yesterday that saw me perform? Got a few people. Thank you. I'm not going to do the same thing I did yesterday. I'm going to switch things up for y'all's entertainment, and this is going to be for everyone. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to swallow a lightsaber, just because. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hammer a giant nail down my throat. And then finally, I'm going to swallow a sword. And Mr. Haig here is going to help me pull it out. Yep. There will be a little bit of a twist in there, though. So let's get started. I'm going to start. <laughs> Don't kill me, Sid. You're an actor. You pretend to kill people. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let's start off with the lightsaber, guys. Is anybody here a fan of Star Wars? You can get these at the Ripley's Believe It or Not gift shop in Dallas, Texas, if anybody's from Dallas. That's where I got this one. I literally took it off the shelf and swallowed it for the crowd there. And sword swallowing is 100% real, guys. There are many people that fake it. I do not fake it. What happens is I suppress the gag reflex. It travels down my throat through the upper esophageal sphincter where it is now in my chest cavity. It squeezes between the lungs. It pushes my heart forward. 
Yes, I will repeat that. It pushes my heart forward. It travels down past the liver and the kidneys into the stomach where it will rest. This is 28 inches, and this is how you swallow a 28-inch lightsaber. Let's get a countdown, guys. 10, 9, Yay, I didn't die. <laughs> it's always great when you pull it out and don't see blood. There are 28 people, professional sword sw 29 professional sword swallowers that have died doing this. This is extremely, extremely dangerous, and I really could die right in front of your eyes. So if this goes well, please make as much noise as you can. If I'm going to die or potentially die, I just want to get at least some recognition. So please, get as loud as you can for this. Now, I'm going to hammer a nail down my throat. But unfortunately, nobody in this entire building apparently has a hammer, even asked maintenance. But the police officers right here, this guy right here, let's give it up for the police officers, guys. Come on. He loaned me his baton, and it's, it's not the first time I've gotten a weapon off an officer, just for the record. But we're going to hammer this nail down my throat. You guys ready? Actually, that, uh, my throat is a little dry. Let me uh, down some water real quick. Yeah, it really sucks when it goes in dry, you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> this is my nail. Here we go, guys. And finally, guys, the moment you've all been waiting for, an actual sword. I am going to swallow a 28-inch sword. It is going to go all the way to my stomach. I am going to bow, and I'm going to turn to Mr. Haig. You are going to pull it out just like this gentleman right here did yesterday. And hopefully you're going to do what he did and not kill me. No twisting. None of this. He's going to twist it. Whatever you do, do not push. That's like the worst thing you can do. He's probably going to Just do nice that. and easy. And I'm going to add a little twist to make this a little more interesting. You guys ready? If you don't have your cameras out, now is the time to do it. And if you're not following Sid on Instagram, there is something wrong with you. It is Sid Haig Says. Give him a follow. All right, guys, here we go. Make some noise, guys. Come on, everybody. <laughs> All right, everybody, give it up for Bear Lee. If you look, if you look, Sid, you can see some of the brisket I had. Some of the brisket? Oh, yeah, I see it right there. Right there, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sid Haig, my name is Bear Lee. Thank you very much. And if you guys want to check them out, go to their booth down the hallway. And, um, Thank you all again for being here for, the, for our last Q&A for the convention. And um, have a good day, y'all. From all of us at PBS.
Remember, weaponize your art and use your weapon responsibly.